So welcome to all. Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome you to this lunch talk organized in the AI for Gov track of the AI for Belgium initiative initiated by uh, BOSA. Um, just before we actually start, let me remind you some practical information. So the webinar is recorded. Uh, please turn off your micro and camera during the presentation. And to ask your question, do not hesitate to use the chat during the session. Casper um, will gather these. We will have a, a short introduction, then the interview of Paul Duan by Davio Larnaut, and then at the end, uh, 15 minutes of Q&A session uh, before the closing. Deliver constantly better services to the citizen is a motto within the administration. FPS BOSA DGDT is the driving force of the digital transformation within the federal public administration and is conscious of the fact that citizens must be in the center. Before we start the interview of Paul Duan by Davio Larnaut, we'll give the floor to illustrate one of the main action done by SPF BOSA toward citizen centricity, digital open. Yazon, you are the change manager at FPS BOSA uh, tra Digital Transformation Di Directorate. I'll leave you the floor to explain your initiative. Thank you, Nathaniel, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, to be here with us today. Um, I think we're going to have a good time with Paul, of course. Um, so, yes, let me please give you a word about what is Digital Open, what basically Digital Open is a community we are building to support our mission of transforming online public services experience for and with citizens. So um, we therefore promote the use of user-centric design techniques so citizens and their needs are onboarded when designing uh, public services. So um, our aim is to become uh, the community for federal agents to rely on when designing public services that put the citizen uh, at the center. So what do we do basically in Digital Open? We have three axes, uh, which is we inform and engage with uh, federal agents on user centricity. We enable federal agents on how to be user centric and we train federal agents to be user centric. When I mean inform and engage, we share knowledge and project experience on project using uh, user centric design techniques to get inspired by others, professionals, and other colleagues that actually apply those principles within the federal uh, public services landscape. Um, this can either come in the form of a case study or via lunch talks, which are inspirational talks in which we invite uh, guests. By the way, there is one tomorrow. Uh, more info on the uh, Digital Open LinkedIn page. I also said we enable. Yes, well, as a starter, um, I invite you to uh, have a look at our quick scan, which is uh, on our digital playbook um, that you can go through and assess your digital maturity score. Um, you'll be surprised by the results you will get there. It's really nice. We have uh, some access and in the end you get a, a score that allows you to identify the, 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 the access where you need to uh, um, improve yourself or your organization, I mean. Um, we provide means to federal agents also uh, by giving them access to expertise so that they can do or let do by design experts. Um, we have a framework agreement with companies so that they can procure this expertise more rapidly. Um, I said also that we train uh, federal agents to become user-centric. We have a, a training catalog um, that is um, accessible. Um, uh, it, Contact me to get it actually, because our digital uh, touch point is currently uh, being uh, revamped. Um, and in there, we uh, provide uh, uh, also e learnings, uh, videos on uh, introductory e learnings and videos on ideation, stakeholder management, design thinking, and digital strategy. Um, we also aim at uh, producing one on user research to really give the possibility to uh, federal agents to start doing by themselves if they don't have uh, the budget to do so. So um, what we intend to do in uh, 2021 is, of course, invest more time and energy in this uh, endeavor. So um, work 
also and improve the way we share uh, project knowledge um, and do more qualitative and quantitative research to monitor our progress and also to get these insights and put it uh, in the in the loop. Um, if you don't know us, I invite you to uh, look up for digitalplaybook.be. Uh, and if you would like to get in touch with us, uh, we have a, uh, an email address, which is the digital open at bozafgov.be. Thank you very much for listening. And Nathanael, up to you. Thank you, Jason. Um, so today we have the pleasure to welcome Paul Duan. Uh, writer of the Manifesto Citizen-Led Public Services that for sure is inspiring and will probably generate a wonderful debate. Uh, it will be interviewed by um, Davio Larnaud for 35 to 40 minutes. So let me introduce you or today's main actors of this lunch talk. Davio Larnaud, Davio, you are the CEO of Radix a Belgium Brussels based uh, artificial intelligence agency. And after working at PwC in Brussels as a senior technology consultant, you decided to take a leap and founded Radix with co founders in 2018. In just over three years, Davio, you've grown Radix from a team of three person to a team of 30 person. Uh, Radix counts uh, 20 six AI projects with proven impact. And your goal as a CEO is to enable Radix to achieve maximum impact and improve as many lives as possible. Uh, thank you for being there and having accepted the invitation to interview uh, Paul. So Paul, um, you are a social entrepreneur using technology to empower people at scale. As the founder and president of Bias Impact, you are one of the pioneers in using algorithms to create social impact. Since 2014, you led multiple projects to the world, ranging from helping microfinance institutions operating in Africa to launching an online platform in partnership with the Department of Justice in California to collect police use of force data from more than 800 police agencies. In 2014, your organization was one of the first nonprofits to be admitted to Y Combinator, the world's most prestigious technology incubator. Prior to Bias Impact, you were the first data scientist at Eventbrite, where you built industry leading uh, fraud detection algorithms. You studied a mixture of mathematics, economics, and political science at Berkeley, the Sorbonne University, and Sciences Po, and where you delivered the school's commencement speech in 2017. Uh, Paul, you served as a member of Action Publique 2022, the French government reform group headed by French Prime Minister Edouard Philippe. You are also a Forbes 30 under 30 recipient and MIT innovator under 35 Europe 2018 and the youngest Ashoka fellow in France and maybe in Europe. So um, Davio, Paul, it's really my pleasure to welcome you today and I give you the floor. Hey. So first of all, thank you for the great introduction. Um, and, and Paul, nice to see you again. Um, maybe we, we can start with just giving a, a short introduction or, or tell us a bit more about Bayes Impact. I, I'm not sure if it's me, but I cannot hear you, Paul. I think you're still I muted. I can hear you, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's uh, nice to see you again, to have you as well. Uh, thanks, uh, Nate, for the uh, for the introduction. So, as uh, as Nathaniel said, uh, so I'm the founder and president of a nonprofit organization called Bayes Impact. And just to give a little bit of context here, the uh, the vision for Bayes Impact is to uh, use technology to address social issues at scale. Um, and so we do that by building what we call citizen-led public services, which we will talk about in this session. 
Um, and essentially think of, think of them as just like Wikipedia, uh, example of services that, that we want to be accessible by everyone that are open source, uh, that contribute to some social issue. Um, over the past few years, uh, we've worked on, uh, on a variety of these. Um, so we had a few examples in the, in the introduction, but ranging from, uh, uh, from employment to healthcare to, uh, to police violence. Uh, and so the model here is that we independently as a nonprofit uh, use uh, uh, philanthropy to, uh, to build these technologies so that we can have this independent citizen centric approach. Uh, and then once we have de-risked the, uh, the solution and we have shown that it works, we then approach uh, NGOs and governments to scale it up uh, by, uh, by implementing them uh, within, uh, within public, public services. All right, great. So, so you have, I know that you have many projects going on. So could you tell us a bit more on, on where you are right now with those different projects? Yeah. So I'll give um, two or three examples. Uh, one, uh, one of the biggest ones and uh, which, which, with which we've actually worked uh, a little bit in, in, uh, in Belgium uh, is around employment. So we built uh, an AI coaching technology for job seekers that's called Bob. Um, and that is basically uh, a way to, um, to automatically provide a personalized assessment for a person's situation. So someone who, who's out of, the, out of a job, being able to automatically identify that these are the strong points, the weak points. These may be the main blockers in finding a job, like maybe you lack some qualifications or maybe uh, we think that's just your application methods. And then based on this assessment, uh, automatically provide some form of personalized coaching where we will regularly push the relevant content, the relevant uh, workshops, the relevant uh, uh, programs that we think the person should attend. And so that is something that can help alleviate the shortage of, uh, of employment coaches within public service, especially now at a time where with COVID, uh, well, there's an explosion of, of uh, uh, in the number of, of uh, unemployed people. And also it's much more difficult to, uh, to provide face-to-face -face interaction to everyone. Um, and so that's a technology with which we've coached about 250,000 people in France and which we are in the process of expanding to a few other countries like, um, uh, like in Belgium with Actiris or with uh, uh, a few states in, uh, in the US um, in, in, uh, in particular. Um, and another example is uh, uh, so related to COVID, we, uh, we built uh, uh, a contact tracing alternative called uh, in French briser la chaîne um, and the uh, notify in, uh, in in English it's um, uh, it's uh, the platform that is used uh, by about a third uh, today of all the the covid uh, positive people in France every single day to report the at risk contacts they may have contaminated um, and, and here is actually a good example of um, of how we operate um, uh, back in uh, back in May, uh, of course, everyone was trying to think of ways to better um, to better monitor the uh, the pandemic. Governments are working on on many uh, solutions, including digital uh, Bluetooth based contact tracing solutions, because you know they felt the human contact traces were uh, well. It was difficult to scale that uh, given the spread of the pandemic, but there there were also some some concerns and some. Uh, uh, and some more is that, that the Bluetooth based technologies either may not reach the scale necessary or that uh, for privacy reasons, people may not adopt it. And so we took a different approach here, which was, well, since the main issue here is that um, uh, it's really time consuming for, uh, for the agents of uh, so the human contact tracers to perform the contact tracing interview and also the process itself is very really clunky. Can we flip it, the logic on its head and empower individuals directly to be uh, to be responsible and to easily uh, report and identify their their contacts in a privacy conscious manner, and so we essentially just digitize the questionnaire um, for, uh, that uh, that the contact trace the human contact tracers would ask, make it super user friendly, uh, add a bunch of cool integrations so that if you answer it on your phone, you can just import the contact directly and don't have to retype it or say it on the phone uh, to someone. So all kinds of things like that. And, and so in the end, no principal solution didn't cost us much to make, but uh, allowed us to, uh, to report hundreds of thousands of, uh, of uh, uh, and to notify hundreds of thousands of, uh, of potentially uh, at risk uh, individuals. All right, that's, that's really, really great. So you, you mentioned empowering individuals and 
um, um, at, at the heart of, of what you do, of what BASIPAC does, is something what you call um, the citizen-led public services, something you wrote a, a pact around uh, as well. Could you explain that a little bit to us, what that exactly means? Yeah. Um, so some in the audience may be familiar with the concept of a government as a platform. So it's essentially a continuation of that. Uh, to explain a little bit government as a platform, uh, the, uh, the idea here is to shift from a model where government is the uh, and all be all the source, so the sole source and creator of public services, but instead they function more like a platform in the sense that they are that they are enablers uh, for uh, an ecosystem of uh, public services to exist and to scale in the same way that uh, public infrastructure is is also enabler. If you think about uh, highways. It's an enabler for people to start companies and uh, and uh, make them successful because you have this infrastructure, um, and so it's kind of an analogy for, for how we could also provide uh, public services. And so the citizen of public services is kind of a continuation of that. It's the idea that everyone, a citizen, uh, should be able to more easily contribute to building the public services they want to see exist uh, by providing um, both a so a framework for uh, collaboration between citizens who have an idea for, for public good and government to scale it. Um, I'm sure you all have seen a lot of examples of how uh, citizen-led energy can be extremely uh, impactful, um, both in creating companies, but also if you, if you look at, uh, uh, at um, all kinds of things where you, when you organize an AI for good hackathon, you see a lot of people who want to contribute, who have innovative ideas. And very often the difficulty here is, is once the thing has, uh, you know, once you created a proof of concept or maybe even you, you helped a few people here is, well, how do you go from there? How do you scale that? How do you then uh, find a way to reach all the beneficiaries? How do you make it sustainable? Um, and there's often a very big gap here where you have a lot of very promising things and you don't really have a good pathway to, uh, to making them into public services. Uh, it's like you have these two walls that could exist, where you have the government on one side, and then you have all the, uh, uh, and then you have the community on the on the other side. Um, and uh, uh, here, the issue, the some of the of the tools to do that exist. There are ways to fund these kind of issues. There, there are ways to simplify procurements. So all these tools are important, but what's lacking is some unifying framework um, in order to shift the culture. And that's something that we have seen firsthand. You know, we. Uh, we come as a as an NGO with some some um, technical technological solutions to uh, uh, to public service, but we have found it very very difficult to approach government to uh, to uh, um, to do these partnerships. It's something that we have been able to do eventually because we had reached some critical mass and we've been able to have some. Uh, um, some access and 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 uh, and contacts with uh, with with officials. Um, I mean, it's a nice way of saying lobbying, but it, it, in, a, in a way, it is uh, what it is. Uh, and, and that's something that we have been able to do as an exception, um, and it was really difficult to do. And and we think that to, tomorrow it should be something that's more of the norm. It should be something that uh, you should not need to have to have access to have too much funding in order to be able to uh, to access a contact that, you know, within government if you want to scale up some innovative. Uh, for good um, uh, technology or product. And, uh, and it's also a way to enhance like, every time you create uh, like an AI for good hackathon like here, uh, there should be a more, much more direct pathway to, uh, to turning these cool ideas into, uh, into the public services of, uh, of tomorrow. I, th that idea of, of like turning those ideas into really something, something that, that works, I, I really, I, I read the whole pack, so I really like the, the whole concept and, and, and the framework, how it works. Now, I, I know Conodify a little bit. Bob, I, I know pretty well uh, uh, right now. So but why, are these, this, why are these such great illustrations? I, I know it, but can you explain us how, how, did, how did this is an illustration of that pact, of, of that framework? Yeah. So, um, so what we propose is in order to, to facilitate the... Um, the uh, the way that citizens uh, or independent groups and the government could work together, um, of course, is not just an issue of of, um, of mistrust. Sometimes it's also because you need to create some shared uh, uh, well, some, some shared values, and um, and it needs to be also reassuring for government to work with people from the outside. Uh, you know, it's not all bad. It's not not all conservatism from the government is bad. 
uh, and, uh, and and so uh, one thing that we identified is as very important um, that the government is sure that when they do a partnership, they can um, uh, they can trust that the values of public services remain uh, remain satisfied, and that's something that we've seen time and time again, both with our products, but also with with other technologies. Um, as uh, Nath said, I was uh, you know as part of a government reform group and. Um, uh, in France, and uh, when they were evaluating solutions on the other side, uh, very often the reason why it was blocking is because they were like, well, actually the way that their, their business model operates, like for example, they do something for orientation for young, uh, for young students, but uh, their business model is to get a freemium uh, service for, um, you know, for, for those who may be able to pay and have priority access to, uh, to the, um, uh, to the uh, admission offices in uh, in higher education, um, so okay, makes sense for them. But for the government, they were like, well, that's kind of that that doesn't match with the public service values of of having universal service, and so this is not compatible. We cannot work together. Um, and so, having seen that, the idea is is uh, what we want to do is to to um, so we propose some form of pact that said um, innovators. Uh, uh, should be able to enter this form of contract with the government that say, okay, we want to re to to um, uh, we're going to ensure that we respect the uh, the values of public services. Like we want to make it as universal as possible. We want to make it bias free. We want to make it transparent. Uh, we want to make sure there's equal access and no preferential uh, access to all. So that's a strong commitment. Uh, it's something that the government is then. Uh, able to check and be the guarantor of. So it is a contractual uh, contractual agreement, but that does facilitate uh, the way of working together. And so one of the idea here is also uh, on the flip side to provide some form of incentive for innovators to have these more visual business models and, and operation models. Uh, because one thing that is also true is that uh, very often when you are a social innovator and you want to do things right, uh, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot um, I know Davio, you also work for good, and so you've probably seen that uh, in, in your work as well. Um, if you want to do it the virtuous way, you know, we don't want to put ads, like Wikipedia doesn't want to put ads on their website uh, because they don't want to bias the content. Um, uh, but as a result, they have to do this this uh, fundraising campaign every single year. Is, you know, it's tiring. And so when you want to do things right and, 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 and not do the, you know, not choose operating models or business models that may conflict with public service values, it's very often more difficult to do uh, uh, to do your work and to scale. And so very often the people that do scale tend to be the less scrupulous uh, uh, companies. And um, and so the idea is kind of a two side deal where for the government, it's it's easier to trust the, uh, the initiative uh, and they have a way to check that it, it does conform to public service values. And on the, on the other side for innovators, it's a, it's a way to reward uh, the uh, virtuousness by uh, by providing preferential access to uh, to distribution or to uh, or to government funding. All right. So um, what what immediately com comes to mind is that um, so you can set it up. You have a framework. You have a contractual agreement that that actually makes for for the the, the right starting point. How how do you make that sustainable? How do you make that like grow and scale? uh such such an effort because i can understand you, you first start you have a good deal but at some point you need to make sure that the incentives keep aligned that you can grow that and 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 that at scale such an initiative yeah uh, so I, I think the solution here depends uh, on the uh, on the specific uh on the specific um issue at hand or specific product uh, so i don't think there's there's one single tool that can be used um but there are multiple that um that uh uh, that are starting to emerge. So, for example, um, you have all the social impact bonds, so or uh, or the whole pay for success schemes. For those who are not familiar, it's, it's a way for the government to uh, uh, to reward social impact. And so, for example, if you say, okay, I through my technology, I can help uh, reduce uh, uh, crime recidivism by X percent. This is worth that much to society. And so, there is uh, some business model here where you are uh, paid by the uh, by the impact you do, and that can scale. So that that is starting to emerge. It's uh, still very early stage, and it's a huge, huge. Uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, in practice very seldom used because it's um, uh, it's actually very difficult to uh, to to engineer and um, 
what's the expression in English for that? Uh, in French, would be an usine à gaz. Um, it's, uh, uh, well, let, let's just say that the process is not streamlined at all. Uh, and so it often costs more to set up than to actually do. Uh, but it's not an issue of concepts, more an issue of, of, uh, of uh, both culture and, and how you, uh, you hone these processes. But that's one example of things that can work. Another example is through regular procurement. So how do you uh, make uh, government procurement easier to access for innovators? So, I mean, that's not new. That's not just from a citizen and public service. It's a more general theme, but that definitely does contribute. Um, uh, one thing that we do propose is also to add uh, some elements of the citizen-led public service pact into the um, uh, into the the the, the flexible uh, you know into the procurement uh, revamp conversations. Just to give one example, in in you know, in France, um, the French Tech uh, Mission uh, recently created a preferential access to government uh, procurement, but not for for uh, for good initiatives. Uh, what they, they did was they selected the 100 most promising tech startups uh, from a purely financial uh, perspective. And they were like, okay, we want to help grow uh, French unicorns. And so in, in order to do that, we're going to create the specific pack, uh, package of services where they, they, they can have an easier time uh, discussing uh, with government, meeting uh, partners there, and having an entry point and contacts, and, and also having uh, easier procurement. So this is all great to, to grow businesses. Um, uh, but one thing that uh, uh, you know that we told the government and, and that we're discussing with them at this time is, well, you know, it's fantastic you create this package for for, for you know based on financial um, criteria, but uh, why could not you create the same uh, the same uh, well the same access and the same package of services uh, based on uh, on values criteria uh, for people who want to do good? All right, cool. So. Um... I, I'm wondering then, so Bob is like, to come back to one of your projects, Bob is really a, a good example of how it works. Mm -hmm. How how does it come that works? How did you succeed at that? Um, well, I think what, what helped is that uh, we had this independence and citizen-led approach, uh, which meant that we were able to just start from scratch uh, when, uh, you know, when, when we came in, we we're just uh, looking at the at the issue of of, uh, of unemployment. We interviewed uh, many many unemployed people and, and trying to figure out what what kind of things could be most useful. Um, and and what we identified was there was a lack of access to quality coaching. Not that the government doesn't provide some. I mean, they have a lot of, of amazing coaches. Uh, but what we saw was that um, they were not often enough. Uh, so it's not it's not that it's not important. It's, it's quite the opposite. It's very important to provide this coaching. But we had many times people who had to wait four months, six months before seeing a coach. Uh, there were also coaches that had 400, 500 people in their portfolio. Uh, so of course, they could not uh, you know, see everyone. Um, and, um, and that is something that we can only do because we're from the outside. And um, uh, you know, what, what you have to see is that the uh, just coming in and say, oh, we want to create an AI uh, in order to... Uh, uh, well, in some form, digitize some of the expertise of the coaches. Uh, it can be highly controversial, uh, or it can be difficult to do because, of course, you have a lot of uh, uh, you have to uh, to to make sure that uh, well, first the, the goal is not to replace coaches. We also have to make sure that uh, uh, you um, you are, you are able to get buy-in from the from the coaches uh, on that solution, so that they not uh, you know they don't see it as a threat, but rather as an opportunity to also. Uh, uh, have more time with uh, you know, with with individuals, um, and that's something that if, uh, I think if we did not do it from the outside. It could never have worked because uh, uh, because from inside the the public service, it was an issue that was considered you know, maybe a little bit too touchy to to uh, to approach. Uh, and uh, and also, if you, uh, there were a, a few other organizations and, and startups uh, who wanted to work on on similar topics and get access to Pôle Emploi data. Um, but uh, for years, like they, they did not, they they were not necessarily able to get that data, and and we know that um, you know, from the conversation we had with with the public service that the reason why they did not have this access is because of this lack of trust in in, in the in in the model and in the, in, uh, in how they could uh, be compatible with public services. Uh, for example, there was uh, there was one I won't I won't name, but their business model was if you pay more, you get you know you get a resume on top of the pile uh, for recruiters. Um, you know, just one example, uh, they were quite, 
uh, and they were quite insistent on being able to access Poland for data, but Poland were you know very um, well defensive because of that reason. And so I think we had this this mixture of being you know uh, on the enough on the outside to be independent and approach a topic from a new eye, but also close enough to public service values that we could uh, find some some middle ground in, in the way that we that we work together. So, so if I, if I hear it well, it's basically one of the things that you're saying is that because we have that pact, we formulate that we say we work according to this framework, that like creates the trust with the government that that that, that allows you to do such projects, for instance. But what are are there are there because that went to a certain like, large scale. You you you're, you've been helping a lot of uh, people in, in in France. Are there any other conditions except for those things that really are necessary to go to scale because um, I, I I can imagine that that's not the only thing you need, not the only ingredient. Um, yeah, I mean it's not it's not the only ingredient, but I think it, it is a big part of it, right? If you if you think about the ingredients that can make something successful, you, I mean you do need some uh, some uh, initial funding uh, to do things, um, but. Uh, we think that um, so there's not just the issue of funding, uh, so both the initial funding and also how do you make the model sustainable and scalable. Um, but uh, one thing that we have really identified as a, as a key thing is is, uh, is distribution. How do you find um, access to uh, to uh, to partnerships in order to uh, to distribute uh, impactful technologies? So I think it goes directly to the issue of, of uh, government as a platform. Um, you know, when, when the tech companies raise, uh, very often you see them raise uh, tens of millions of dollars in Series A, and they would like to tell you that it's because they want to, to uh, they have such amazing technology that just the R&D costs tens of millions. Uh, but in, I mean, it's true in some cases, but in, in the overwhelming uh, majority of the cases, uh, what people uh, in startups raise money for is acquisition. You know, they raise money to... Uh, um, well, to spend the tens of millions in, in, in ads in order to, you know, to get customers with the idea that you get more from the customer in lasting value than you get from ads. Uh, but so distribution really is key here. So of course, when you talk about uh, uh, social impact issues, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I don't think it makes as much sense to raise tens of millions to do, a, uh, to do an acquisition campaign um, or something that's much less natural. But on the flip side, um, we actually have a lot of, of opportunities from government that, that already has this type of access to uh, to people at scale. And uh, I see from chat, I'm trying to read at the same time without disrupting the conversation, but I see that uh, in chat, in the, one of the, the issues that you raise, and it's very true, is, is you want to, because it's public service, you want to make it accessible to everyone, including people who don't have access to, uh, to, uh, to technology or to internet uh, or to digital tools. And so you do need this brick and mortar um, so physical uh, link to people. And this is something the government is actually very good at. Um, if you look at the, the postal service, they have access to people everywhere in, in, uh, in, in the country, including the most remote areas of people who don't have connections. Uh, they have a lot of physical, uh, uh, physical offices here. And, um, and uh, you know, even though they are under tension right now, so there is some financial pressure to close some of these, which is kind of a shame. Um, um, but um, we think there is a way to actually leverage this network to, to better distribute innovate, uh, social innovation. And, uh, and actually, there are some moves in France towards that, trying to transform some of the, uh, you know, instead of closing down some, some uh, physical offices for public services um, because of lack of, of uh, uh, well, because of, of, um, of the distribution of people in France, the one thing they're trying to do is to regroup them into what they call France service um, um, offices where they can have uh, some kind of, of um, it's like a, almost like a hub, an open space where people can come in and be helped on various administrative things, as opposed to doing it by silo and having it be a way to to uh, to distribute this innovation. All right, cool. So I also hear it's a very like close cooperation between those two things. It's it's really it's not just the NGO. It's really the government and the NGO. It really needs to work together to to, to achieve this. And and. Apart from Bayer's impact, are there any examples of, of other companies that, that work at scale, uh, according to, to the, the, the citizen-led um, public services? Uh, yeah, there, there's a few. Uh, there are a few examples. Um, so both uh, recent and, and less recent. Um, and uh, so in recent times, for example, we've seen a lot in uh, so for the you know, in terms of COVID crisis uh, response. Um, 
I think that so there has been a there has been an uptick in uh, in citizen participation. I think also in part because the uh, when crisis times you do need all the all the energy on on uh, on um, uh, on deck uh, for that. So there's um, uh, there's some companies, for example, that built uh, the official diagnostics, uh, so online uh, pre-diagnostic, for example, for uh, for COVID, um, and and they had this close collaboration with government. Um, and uh, well, in if you if you go a little bit back, uh, but still quite recent, if you look at Wikipedia, for example, uh, it was kind of this, this UFO when it first started. Um, and um, I was in school at the time uh, when 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 it, uh, when it was created. And I remember all the 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 well the, the school administrators being like, "Well, you cannot use Wikipedia. It's the, it's like the devil. <laughs> it's uh, it's not reliable. Everything. I mean." People can, can still say that, but it's now it's a lot more accepted, and you actually have some government directives to, to use open source and open data uh, in uh, in in, um, in knowledge transmission, and that's something that is that is more okay now because you have uh, uh, you know because you have a little bit more hindsight on uh, on Wikipedia and how it operates. Um, and if you go uh, further, further back, um, you actually have some historical examples of, of, of things that, that first were independent groups and, and, and that uh, became a public service. Uh, from a historical perspective, 100 years ago, uh, French social security uh, actually came from, uh, from independent cooperatives that organized themselves saying we want to create a, a social service among ourselves. Uh, and that is something that ended up being reintegrated and being made something national, um, you know, between uh, between the world wars. And so, uh, uh, so there is a string of examples here. It's um, it's still quite, you know, by and large, it's still something that that is um, more historical accidents than uh, than a dedicated uh, than a dedicated pathway. So I think that's we think that's something that needs to change. Uh, in um, so I'm talking. Uh, I've only been talking about about you know a country like France here, and developed countries in general. Uh, but actually, something where there is a lot of super exciting things are more in developing countries. Uh, in the, in developing countries, if you look at Kenya, for example, the financial system is a startup with you know with M-Pesa. Um, I think something about a third to to a half of all the financial transactions go through the mobile money system, um, and it is. You know, it is something where in developing countries where, where you don't have all this, this uh, established infrastructure, there is a lot of innovation going on from the, from the community um, and with a lot more porosity between, uh, between these uh, com community uh, uh, initiatives and, uh, and public services. And that's actually something that we think we can also learn from a little bit. All right. There, there, there's one thing that, 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 I, that I, I always wanted to ask because coming from a more it's a private company that, that we run so it's it's a different it's a different way of, of, of managing it and there's also uh, a different way of, of incentives and and that's really like that's core and then in the end in my opinion any company anything you do it's the incentives on the long run that you need otherwise it will fail at any point uh, at some point at least yeah, exactly um, incentives so if if you talk about talk about this do you see this then like evolving as where the government like you said is the guard but is also like just saying it plainly dividing the money and there's like an alternative ecosystem where companies like have competition but it's rewarded based on social impact is that how you see it evolving to to, to the future of or, or how how should i how should i see that how can how what's your vision on that um well there's twofold i think one within this uh, within uh one uh market i mean i i do think it's good to have more innovation and that sometimes does mean competition so different ways of doing things um it's uh, you know it's it's also a way to test that uh, like for example if you if you look at COVID contact tracing things um, well the problem is too important the the it's important that we have different approaches some that use Bluetooth some that use uh, other digital solutions some that don't use digital solutions uh, and and these need to coexist right um, and, and actually we have seen. Um, well, the, the flip side of it, where we, we, where we don't do that and, and we put all of our eggs in the same basket and, and, and sometimes it doesn't work. And, and, uh, and I think with COVID, I, mean, I don't want to point fingers at anyone because it's, uh, you know, for, every, for any single uh, solution, I don't think I would have done better. Uh, but because we had this, this approach, you know, very often we took many, many delays um, and, and just had a lot of dramatic effects. Uh, and um, I, I do think that we had a, a more vibrant ecosystem here. Um, that is something that, at least in part, we could have um, 
alleviated a little bit. Um, it's uh, I think where we don't want to do too much fragmentation and too much uh, you know too much competition um, uh, as much as possible. You talked about incentives, um, and, and I think this is key. It's uh, you know, one of the key incentives that's important to do, I, again, I don't have all the answers here. Um, one key incentive is promoting uh, the use of commons, uh, meaning as much as possible, if you can make something open source and find business models where you can share the core uh, technology as, as part of, uh, you know, something that is, uh, uh, that is a commons, uh, that can go a long way uh, towards having uh, I guess your, your cake and eat it too, right? Having uh, this ecosystem where you can have uh, different and even competing solutions. But at the end of the day, if, if something is, is uh, uh, works better, um, where you can find a way to reintegrate it uh, within, within other services. So uh, finding the right incentives to open source is very important. I don't have all the answers here because that in itself, <laughs> how do you incentivize open source is, is an entire topic. Um, and uh, you can do an entire round table around that. Uh, but definitely that's one. And, and another thing that, you know, in terms of vision that I would love to see and that to me is super important is, is international cooperation. Just talking from people from, from different countries, even in France and, and Belgium, where we, you know, we, we do share a lot of, of, uh, of, uh, of cultural uh, aspects and, uh, you know, it's easier for us to, to communicate. Even, even then, you know, I, I just uh, having worked in multiple countries, I see ourselves reinventing the wheel a lot and very often. Um, and um, uh, it, it's both a shame because it's something where we could collaborate a lot more across uh, across countries. You know, there's no reason why uh, a course of innovation that comes out of AI for Belgium cannot be something that, that we could use here in France, or that, you know, could use in Italy or, or, uh, or in Argentina. Um, I mean, of course, you need to adapt it to local context, but I think there's a lot to be uh, to be learned here, which we don't really do much. And uh, from a uh, European perspective, uh, I, I mean, I'm I'm um, I want to go too much into politics. I'm uh, uh, whatever your yeah your uh, opinion in Europe is. I mean, I do think that something that would be very very strong symbolically is uh, to have a shared set of uh, of citizen initiatives that try to improve social issues across across Europe and that could that could make the idea of what Europe means actually something that is uh, uh, well that is more more concrete uh, to to everyone I think that's a great great ending um, I think uh, um, thank you for your time for the the, 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 the interview um, um, for the next part um, I'll, I'll leave it up to uh, uh, the organizers um, I think the main uh, next session is now the Q&A so thank you Paul um, really, really, really interesting. Thanks. So thank you both. Uh, Davio, you can, you can stay here and, and Paul. Uh, so the Q&A session is for you huh? also, Paul. So, so the first question, we have many questions, huh? um, is uh, what, what kind of application uh, can be uh, citizen-led and, and what kind of uh, public service cannot be uh, um, consider with, with this approach. Paul? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought <laughs> you were switching from the next uh, panelist. Do you mind repeating the, the question? Uh, yeah, it's uh, are all the public services um, uh, possibly uh, um, possibly uh, managed by a, a citizen-led approach, do you think? Are, are there some, some public service that cannot be integrated in this view? Uh, no, I mean, not all of them. I mean, first off, because not everything can be, uh, can be digital. So there's limitations to that. Although I do think that some citizen-led public services do not need to be digital. Actually, we have a few examples in, in uh, I know a few examples of, uh, of such where, for example, you have a community network of people who go door to door to, uh, uh, to inform people in, in, in poor uh, in, um, uh, neighborhoods where you don't have as much access. So there's a few things here, but first, uh, by and large, I think um, there are some issues where you do need, uh, uh, where you do need the government to operate it, either because it's not uh, super prone to digital or because it's, uh, well, if you look at justice, for example, there are some things that you do want to be uh, 
you do want the decision, uh, the end decision to be done by, uh, by someone who's a, uh, who is a, a public servant. And so uh, uh, what we want to differentiate is essentially the, uh, uh, so if I had to make a rough classification, there are a lot of things in, in public service where it's about operations. So if you want to make something as, if, as efficient as possible, I think this is something that can be done by citizen-led public service. Uh, if it's something that requires a decision, in, you know, it needs to be the government because you need to be, you know, it needs to be backed by uh, by the government if it's a decision on the lives of, of people. Yes, Paul, are you still there? Uh... Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, so, sorry. Yeah, I was maybe disconnected for for a while. Um, so thank you. Um, what would be your advice for agents working in the public services to trigger innovation of the of the public services? Um, uh, yeah. So, um, well, I want to approach this question with a lot of humility. <laughs> I know there's a lot of things that are already being done. Um, you know, it's a, there's no one one single thing. There's multiple uh, there's multiple uh, things to me that help. Uh, one is, uh, well, of course participating in initiatives like yours, <laughs> Nath, uh, uh, you know, with, with AI for Belgium. Uh, uh, so there's one about one thing about just being uh, more in touch with the community. And, and, uh, uh, and I think this is a great first step. Uh, one thing that we have seen also in terms of cultural change is also help uh, having challenges from the inside. Um, uh, for example, um, there's not just something about entrepreneurs from the outside. There's a lot of, of, uh, of people with great ideas inside uh, public service. And it's also favoring intrapreneurship. Uh, so it's both something that is, to me, extremely important to get important new ideas because entrepreneurs within public service are in contact with the beneficiaries. And so they have a lot of underground uh, knowledge as opposed to sometimes, you know, if things are decided behind closed doors, uh, you know, inside, uh, inside the ministry. Um, and something that can be both beneficial, but also is a good first step to, um, to um, creating this culture of more open innovation in a way that's, I think, a little bit more safe because it's, you know, it's, it's open innovation, but still people on the inside. So it can be a good first step. Um, and then lastly, in order to, to open it, um, uh, I, I really like, uh, so there's the, the economist Mariana Maducato, if you know, if, I don't know if you're familiar with, with her. Um, well, she helped devise a few a few challenges, like for the European Union on the um, on the green uh, you know, for the the green deal. Um, um, I quite like what she says in that you know she, she's advocating for for governments to have more of an uh, of a challenge approach as opposed to uh, uh, when, when they do procurement, they have the, the specific specs they want to uh, to achieve, but instead trying to formulate it as okay, what kind of challenge do we have? Uh, what's the open question we want? and then um, leave the space a bit more free to solutions they may not have uh, expected. And so uh, having this cultural shift where the government sees itself uh, uh, as, the, pers uh, as the, the institution that's here to, um, to surface the right questions, uh, as opposed to necessarily having all the right answers. Okay, and what do you think about the uh, entrepreneurship program uh, in France? I don't remember exactly the name. Uh, have yeah. you participated to that? Uh, yeah, so I, I, particip I participated in that. Uh, so there are two. Uh, one program called BetaGov. Um, uh, so it's uh, they call what they, startup data, so um, government startups, where they try to uh, to promote entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs within different areas of public service, uh, like for example, entrepreneurs from Pôle Emploi, so the employment agency, and. Uh, and then they provide them with an acceleration program for a few months with some seed funding and, uh, and they assign some product owners and, and tech people to help them. Uh, so I think that's a great program. There's a lot of great things that have come out of it. Um, uh, there is always a question of once this, this exists, how do you reintegrate this technology or this product inside the main administration? So that's the main challenge for them. Um, and another program I was actually part of in, in, uh, in creating um, is uh, something called the uh, public interest entrepreneur, so entrepreneur d'intérêt général uh, in French. Uh, and so here the idea is a bit different. So if you look at the uh, beta groove, it's like how you take people from the inside and you kind of 
uh, take them out to do, uh, you know, to, to build uh, government startups uh, on the side with the issue of reintegrating it. The um, entrepreneur d'intérêt général is like the opposite where um, they, they had this program where they, um, they, they essentially ask for a tour of duty. Uh, so people who are tech people or entrepreneurs to spend a year or more um, within uh, within government, and so they are people from the outside who are integrated inside uh, to uh, to help them do innovation. So almost like entrepreneurs in residence. Thank you, Paul. There, there is a question about the legal issue, uh, for example, about data sharing inherent to your citizen-led approach. Could you elaborate a bit on on, on these uh, legal issues? Yeah, uh, it's it's definitely a big thing. It's something we we uh, you know we have been working on with um, with uh, with lawyers and legal experts here uh, in order to create some form of precedent. Uh, so for us, we have uh, conventions or agreements, like data sharing agreements, with uh, institutions um, that govern this. So it's a legal document, and and it does say. Uh, well, you commit to respecting these kind of values and exchange, you can have access to data and, and it's re revoked if, if, uh, you know, if you don't respect that. Um, so as actually kind of goes back to something that Davio said, we were kind of able to do this ad hoc and then we were trying to, uh, to see what has worked and try to turn it in, into a framework after the fact. Um, and that's something that we love to, uh, like the, um, uh, well, you know, if you look at the different uh, licensing agreements for the for, for comments, for example, you have these template forms that have started to emerge where people can use it. Um, for, you know, for creative comments, for example, for open data. Um, one thing that I'd love to see is, um, uh, you know, right now we have these data sharing agreements that we negotiate um, every every time with 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 a, 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 when we work with government and. Uh, and that's cumbersome, and and but we're able to do it because we have the uh, the um, you know we have the uh, the experience doing that. But it would be great if there was some kind of, of more uh, template form that says, okay, this is a citizen-led public service uh, data sharing agreement. These are the the conditions, and you can apply it. And so that I think could make it a lot of things um, a lot of things a lot smoother. Um, just to and just to add a little bit on that very quickly, I know there's, um, so there has been uh, uh, discussions in France, like, uh, I mean, I know you worked on it uh, when you were with uh, Digital Minister Axel Le Maire uh, in France. Um, uh, we, uh, there were a lot of, of conversations around, can we create a class of data that is like a public interest data where the government could almost force uh, administrations or companies to, to turn it into open data. And the one thing that was kind of difficult is that it was really difficult to define before the fact uh, like what is intrinsically an, an, uh, a public interest data because some data can be public interest sometimes depending on the, on the application. Um, and, um, but I think the concept is, is, is still very important. And so to me, it's kind of like a, a different spin on that. Uh, so citizen-led public service is, is, is um, it could be a way to not just, instead of saying, okay, these are data that are uh, public interest. Um, instead, I think we could regulate, okay, these are usage of, uh, of this data that is public interest and as such should have preferential access to that data. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have uh, two more questions um, because we won't be able to answer all of these, but um, a, a question from Osto Taspinar. Uh, what would be the minimum step for the government, um, the minimum step that the government should take in order to, to become really citizen-led? Uh, I think minimal step, there are ways without spending a lot of money, um, just uh, having the government do more challenges. Um, and, and open contributions on the outside. I think that doesn't require money and there can be a small step to, to that. And uh, hopefully what, what's going to happen is the government sees that once they do these challenges, they have a lot of interesting things that, that come out of it and that can spark and inspire them to, uh, to, to go to the next step. So I would say that's, a, that's the first step. And maybe another one is, is uh, uh, that can be quite simple is, is have um, a representative that can be the point of contact for people from the outside because very often one thing i've seen time and time again 
from social innovators is that they have some solution, but they're kind of facing a wall. They have no idea how to contact. They have this vague idea that, that it could be great to have a partnership with the government, but um, <laughs> apart from going on some government website and the ministry of something and trying to find a contact email, they don't really know who to talk to. And that could be, um, yeah, that could be, uh, uh, and I think that could be key. And if on top of that, we could even have something that is a label that says you know, uh, in partnership with the government, that could be uh, also a way to help promote these solutions without spending any money. Um, actually, there have been some examples here with COVID-19 where uh, the government didn't have time to build everything, uh, you know, of course, for the COVID response. And there were a lot of great initiatives that came from the community. So for example, one that like one doctor that built a online pre-diagnostic tool that was used by millions of people in France. Uh, in the end, they were able to get this small label in, that says in partnership with the Ministry of, of, uh, of Health uh, that was that could make them more credible. And also the because they had this label, the government could promote them. So on the information website, you could say, oh, if, you, if you are uh, worried you may have COVID, use this website built by someone else in partnership with, with us. Um, and so um, just to wrap that up, um, that's also a cheap way for government to work together. It's, it's basically citizen-led public service. Uh, because they had this, this pact, but it's really light, lightweight. And uh, instead of going the full way with funding, with contracts and, and so on and so forth, just having a branding uh, relationship, I think can be uh, also um, a really quick win. So thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, maybe in, in, in two set sentences, the last question about AI, what do you think about AI? Is it a key enabler technology to activate digital transformation within the public services? Is it a must-have or is it only a hype? Uh, no, I think it's uh, just in two sentences, AI can be super important. Uh, some ways of using AI is hype uh, because AI cannot fix everything. But uh, what can be very important with AI is, is finding different ways of, um, of achieving results in public service. And I think very often it's, uh, it's, um, it's about how do you empower individuals? Whereas, you know, sometimes with AI, uh, you know, before AI, uh, some expert decisions could only be done by a select few uh, people. And so that's kind of a bottleneck. Instead, you know, with AI, how do you democratize this? How do you help uh, everyone, every beneficiary also be, uh, uh, be proactive in, in, um, you know, in, in, um, in doing the right things uh, with energy renovation? I've seen this, for example, where a key bottleneck is that engineering your home renovation project is really difficult. Finding the right help is difficult. I think if AI could help that, for example, you could radically open the possibilities of who can do that. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. I must now wrap up, absolutely, because we run maybe a little out of time. I don't know if you see uh, my screen. Yeah, well, thanks everyone. And uh, I, I left my contact info in the chat if you yeah. have the conversation. Well, right, thank you everyone. very much to Yazon, uh, Davio and, and, and Paul. Uh, thank you very much for having participated to that. Do, please uh, contact us if you have any question about that. Um, I don't know if you see my screen, but these are the next uh, events in the AI for Gov uh, track. So on February 10, we have a, a big event with uh, the Netherlands, Luxembourg and, and Belgium coalition about AI and, and a special breakout session about future of work and data sharing and AI for Gov with the focus with the police application. Um, we will have a plenary session on AI in the public service in February 18 with a focus on the regional initiatives. And the next lunch talk is with Michel Erquet on the open source AI tools we can use uh, within the, the public administration. Uh, please note already that from the 15 to the 19, we will organize with all the partners and all the actors of, on AI in Belgium, the, the Belgian AI Week. So I thank you um, for your, your coming and, and uh, see, say, uh, say goodbye and, and see you, see you uh, next time and see you soon. Thank you, everybody.